Retired four-star Admiral John Richardson was the US Chief of Naval Operations and led their naval nuclear program. He was a consultant for the Australian AUKUS Task Force, and he joined me earlier from Washington. Admiral Richardson, welcome to 7.30. Sarah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Is there any pushback inside the US Navy at the idea of giving up submarines in short supply to the Australian Navy? Well, I think that there's certainly, you know, a demand signal there. And uh, if you've, I'm sure you've read that we're still building towards what we would see as the appropriate number of uh, submarines in our inventory. Uh, so, you know, th that would be, you know, one factor. But I think that the positives of this arrangement far outweigh any kind of detraction in terms of just raw numbers. And so the chance to, as I said, build this sort of web of interoperability with a very close ally in the Pacific uh, where Australia is, I think that all of those opportunities uh, outweigh uh, any delay we may have in getting to the number that we need. And so as long as we're doing this in a very measured and informed way, I think that uh, this is a net positive. We hear a lot here about AUKUS being about deterrence, but again, from the US Navy perspective, how does it enhance deterrence for you when there are fewer boats in US Navy hands? The overall deterrent posture in the region, I think, will be enhanced by virtue of bringing a, a very capable and close partner into this uh, you know, deterrent network, if you will. And so as you've seen, there's been a number of arrangements that have uh, recently sprung up between the United States and Japan, the United States and the Philippines. Uh, you know, these arrangements, I think, all work together. Uh, and now that this uh, enhancement of the arrangement between the U.S. Navy and the Royal Australian Navy, you know, again, I think that this, in the aggregate, uh, increases the overall deterrent posture in the region. Does that mean that AUKUS has an important symbolic power? No, I think it goes far beyond symbology. This is going to be actual capability delivered to a partner. There are going to be actual uh, operations that, uh, you know, will result from this capability. And so, you know, far beyond symbolic, there's, there's a real, you know, almost measurable deterrent quality that results from uh, this agreement. Explain what that is. Well, uh, you know, one uh, measure of this might be just uh, the ability to deploy and keep on station you know, maritime forces. You know, th th that's far beyond symbolic. Those are, you know, measurable uh, operations that you know, are, are watched very closely by everybody in the region. And I think they'll have, you know, not only a deterrent effect, but, you know, coincidentally, you know, a very stabilizing effect in the region. Again, from your point of view, what does Australia offer the U.S. military in the event of a Chinese attack on Taiwan? Well, uh, you know, working in close partnership, uh, we would hope, as just to continue on with our last point, that uh, this would provide, you know, a, enough deterrent effect uh, so that, uh, you know, when one considers uh, a movement against Taiwan, you would have to assess that uh, any of that, any, any action like that would be unsuccessful, right, by virtue of the uh, response forces that are right there in the area. And so, you know, the uh, contribution and the presence of the Royal Australian Navy, particularly when it includes uh, advanced uh, nuclear submarines, uh, you know, this, uh, this, I think, would influence that calculus a great deal. And uh, hopefully, you know, we, we prevail and, and persist in a situation where there is no uh, military action against Taiwan uh, because any such action would be deemed to be unsuccessful. What is the advantage of nuclear-propelled submarines in the event of conflict in the South China Sea or the East China Sea? Yeah, well, uh, what you get from a nuclear power plant and nuclear propulsion is the ability to stay submerged on station, you know, essentially, in, you know, for an indefinite period of time. Uh, the limiting factor tends to be food in these uh, types of situations. And so, you know, that ability to uh, stay on station. And then the other thing you get is just, you know, tremendous persistent uh, speed. And so the ability to 
move through, you know, what are vast distances in the uh, Pacific region, the Indo-Pacific region. You know, nuclear propulsion just gives you the combination of, you know, being able to stay submerged for long, long periods of time, staying on station and repositioning at speed. You know, it really is a, a, a very advanced uh, capability in the maritime domain, you know, for what are, you know, maritime nations. What happens if a nuclear-powered submarine carrying a nuclear reactor is hit by a missile? You know, we've done, uh, just speaking for the uh, U.S. Navy, you know, those sorts of uh, scenarios are taken into full consideration when we uh, design the submarine. Uh, And so, you know, they're built incredibly robust to withstand those types of scenarios. I think I'm right in saying that two U.S. nuclear submarines sank in the 1960s. What happens to the reactor and the fuel if the submarine sinks? Uh, you know, those reactors uh, went to the bottom of the ocean, and uh, it, we, we continue to monitor those. There has been really, you know, no kind of uh, release to the environment. So, you know, that part of the design uh, did exactly what it was supposed to do. Admiral Richardson, thank you very much indeed for joining us. It's a pleasure, Sarah. Thank you.